Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining. Good to see you here. I see there's a lot of people in the chat already. Let's go ahead and throw up the map. Cross your fingers. I hope this button's gonna work. It worked. All right. We are getting things put back together here. So hopefully this is a little bit more um, cohesive of a stream compared to the last couple of weeks where everything in my studio was completely torn apart. Great to see everybody here. Thank you for joining. Happy New Year. First stream of 2021 and uh, I'm super excited. So yeah. Hi, everybody. I see there's a lot of folks in the house today. Happy New Year to to you, Christoph and Bart and um, great. I see a couple of questions already coming in. That is great. I'm going to go ahead and scroll back to those in a minute. Um, just a reminder, if you do have a question for me today, make sure you mention my full name at Aaron Parecki in the chat, and that makes it show up nice and big on my screen here. And that is a lot easier for me to find this that way. So with that, let me uh, get rid of this music. And yeah, we are we are good to go. How oh, did I forget to add the audio? No, the audio should be in sync here. The the audio should be in sync here because I'm running it through the camera, double checking that. Yes, I'm running through the camera, so should be fine here. All right, let me pop over to the chat so I can take a look at some of the questions that are coming in. Getting my macros back up and running, so this is nice that that is working a little better now. All right, I saw a couple questions in here. Thank you very much, Monkey Rock Music. I appreciate the the uh, thanks. I wish Blackmagic would consider your request of adding macro buttons and additional HDMI output and audio output. I sure hope so. Who knows? There is no telling what they're going to do and when. Nobody knows. I don't even think they know. So who knows what we'll get this year. Hopefully it should be a fun year of new product launches, though. How do I do that map? I still haven't done a video about it because it's still more work than it should be to actually get get running for other people. It involves dealing with the Google API and all sorts of stuff. So it's a bunch of custom code that I wrote. We'll see if I ever get around to publishing it. I need to redo the waiting room screen. The ATEMs aren't white. My actual ATEMs aren't white either. I haven't painted those yet because it takes too much to actually take those apart to get to the top piece so you can paint it. And I'm not sure I'm going to actually, uh, not sure I'm going to actually do that. Yeah, the audio is quite noisy. I am sorry about that. So we're back on the overhead microphone that I have uh, connected to my camera. And it is, it's only about a foot away from me. It's right up there. You can't see it. Um, but it is the little, um, the little pink one, the Movo. And that is pointing this way, but right down here is a very large contraption running the stream, and I have not yet got the replacement part in for the fan for it. So I should be able to, with any luck, show you that angle. Okay, almost perfect cut. I'll fix that. But this is the thing I'm talking about. Um, can you focus? This is what I've been building, and this piece has two very loud fans inside of it, and that's what's making all the noise. And tomorrow I should be getting in a, a replacement for the fans, and then it will be almost silent, and then things will be a little bit back to back to a better situation in here. Sounds like Aaron is in a factory. Pretty much am in a factory. Oh, also, my printer is going back there. I am making some more parts for things. So it's not that noisy, but it is there's a little bit of a whir, whirring noises. 
So how did you, how did you deal with the 20 by 20 uh, HDMI to SDI and HDCP? I guess you can't use HDCP devices. That is correct. None, none of this, the little converters don't strip HDCP. These little, these little converters are the things converting all my HDMI to SDI. They don't strip HDCP because they're like legitimate devices. Um, but I do have, I only have one HDCP device on here, which is the Chromecast. And that might change after, I think, what is it, tomorrow? I'm doing the stream where I'm testing a bunch of the Miracast devices, which supposedly some of them don't even do DHCP or HDCP. Um, so with any luck, that might change. However, the the other eight, part of the HDCP story is uh, that devices that do support HDCP, like your Mac, it, if it recognizes that the source that it's sending to supports HDCP, it will encrypt the signal. However, if the device says it does not support it, then it won't encrypt the signal. So it's about the sending device, whether or not it will properly negotiate or always go into HDCP mode. And the Chromecast is one that just always does HDCP. And that's the only device that doesn't work natively. And for that one, I use the same HDCP stripper that I've been using for the ATEM itself. Just a little splitter. What was the HDMI switcher you were using before your SDI one? I don't even remember what it was called because it was not a good one. I don't, I don't recommend it. It was the cheapest one that I found on Amazon and it was just loud. Like every time you push any button, it would beep really loud and it could only be controlled over a like serial protocol. There was no network interface for it. So there are some more expensive ones that seem like they're probably fine. And I just, I started adding things up and at the point I was going to have 20 inputs, it would have cost at least as much to just go with the SDI version, which is theoretically more reliable. Although I am seeing a small glitch here, which is that the Chromecast input is blinking every now and then. So the chat is flickering. And I think there's a cable or something uh, loose back there, which I'll have to debug. I am not using the M5 stack today because I'm back at my desk setup where I've got my stream deck controlling this. And I probably will be using it, however, tomorrow for when I'm at that table. It's actually connected to that ATEM on the table over there. And that is when I'm, when I'm programming on my computer, I don't want to be switching back and forth. I don't want to take my stream deck over there because it requires unwiring everything. So uh, that is when I'll be using the M5 stack. Oh yeah, I did have printed sheet overlays. I haven't finished that yet. I'm, I'm not happy with the original uh, design that I did. So I want to redo that design and I might, uh, I might end up sort of sticking those to my ATEM if I do them on a, a vinyl sticky. Oh yeah, the, the uh, monitor setup here this was uh, after my desk build stream. So I, I got this more put together and I'm actually totally happy with the offset monitors here. This one's for my computer. This one is kind of the multi view for, for this. And of course, because everything is routable, I can actually just change these around if I want. So I could say my computer screen goes up there. Um, like if I go to, what is it? This one left monitor will now become my, uh, where's my computer? My computer and boom now it's takes a second for the hdmi to negotiate with that monitor but now it's my computer monitor but that's not what i want so i'm going to bring that back to my multi-view you've been replacing fans now for some time what do you recommend for blackmagic hyperdeck studio mini uh, that one, the Noctua fans are the best. And that's the one that I replaced mine with. And it is dead silent, even when it's recording. It's And recording should generate more heat than just playing back. So uh, that's been totally fantastic. I still haven't like edited my video about... I, I filmed the whole process of replacing them. I haven't edited that together because, I don't know, it's like mildly interesting and I have a lot more content to get through first. Also, like you can just go watch the tutorial video from... Noctua who sells those fans and there's a video about there's actually a video where somebody just went and replaced the fan step by step in that and it's a pretty straightforward uh, tutorial video so 
that is, uh, yeah, the Noctua fans have been great. Oh, I also put one in the power supply for my overhead lights, which are, I post about this on our, on the forums. I have a thread going where I'm documenting the whole studio process and I have a Noctua fan up in that as well. All right, that's enough studio stuff. Let's get to some live streaming questions. So, and remember, if you do have a question for me, make sure you mention my name so that it stands out in the chat for me. Oh, this is a good question. Any recommendations for intercom for video teams in a live streaming environment? So actually there is a very cool new intercom system that I have not yet tested because I don't really have an environment to give it a fair shot in, but Hollyland just released a intercom system and it looks fantastic. It is, um, oh, I'm on my computer and my computer is routed in here so I can just share my screen now. Again, I haven't, I haven't actually tested this, fair, fair warning, but this thing, uh, based on my experience using other Hollyland stuff, this I'm sure is fantastic. So it's got uh, dual, you know, as many transmitters and receivers as you want. Um, little, it comes with little headsets. I don't know. I... Like I said, I haven't actually used it and I haven't, I don't have an excuse to actually use this in practice right now either, because this is just me here and that's going to be the case for this foreseeable future. But uh, that one I'm sure is going to be a great option. Recommendation for powering a mobile ATEM mini setup. Will a large power bank or something like that work? I, that's a good question. So the ATEM takes 12 volts, it takes quite a bit of power. It's I don't think a um, I don't think a USB battery, even with a converter to 12 volts, would work. I think it would take too much, uh, too many watts to make that be a good option. But you can get batteries that are 12 volts, and I have one at home, which I should try. I've been meaning to do to try that one out. It's like a little, it, I don't know. It looks like a little like car battery or something. They made it look cute like a car battery, and it's got a 12 volt out. It's a big, big battery. It's not something you can take on an airplane, um, but it is, I'm sure it would power the mini, no problem. So I do, I've been meaning to give that a shot. I think you would need, the thing to make, make, make sure you look for though, is the, the wattage output. So the A10 mini and the pro and, and the ISO have a different input power requirements. So if you look at the bottom, it will say how many Watts it needs at 12 volts. So then make sure the battery can provide at least that much. Which software do you recommend for broadcast? I really like Ecamm Live. Yeah, that's a really cool piece of software, uh, but I don't use a Mac, okay. Can you suggest any other software for adding more graphics and overlays? So H2R Graphics is a great option as well. That is a free program from uh, Here to Record from John Barker and it is cross-platform. It runs on anything, and it will give you a little a little window to control a separate window that has all the graphics. So you can do lower thirds, images. You can even do YouTube chat now, and uh, countdown timers and all sorts of good stuff in there. That one, I think, is a great option just because it is free and pretty straightforward to integrate into, into a system. If I want to feed multiple cameras wirelessly into the ATEM, do I need a Hollyland transmitter for each camera or is there a workaround? Uh, yeah, you would need a transmitter for each camera. I don't know if I've seen any multiple channel transmitters. I think you just get diminishing returns at that point, trying to pack all that hardware into a single box. But yeah, each camera will provide a feed into, um, each camera needs its own separate link back into the ATEM wirelessly and a receiver would go one into each of the inputs. Do you know of a device that allows to play media files from a list without showing the list, similar to playing media on an extended PC screen while controlling from main monitor? 
Yeah, a lot of the, um, there's a lot of special software for doing this. So there's uh, an app on the iPad, iMix, iMix 16 or iMix 20, or they have different numbers depending on how many inputs I guess they have. And that can be configured to do that. There's also um, the HyperDeck. If you want hardware option, the HyperDeck is a great option for that. You can just put a bunch of files on that on a card and it'll run through them. Um, that is what's playing my countdown timer at the beginning. So the countdown is an animation that just has the number countdown and the music track. And I just have one file on that card and it just loops. But the, I guess what you want to stay away from is the stuff like sort of desktop consumer media players, because those tend to have a lot of the, um, it, it treats it more like you're playing it on a TV where you need to see the control interface. What do you recommend for an, an affordable mic that works well at a distance out of frame? My studio condition needs to be too hot with it 18 inches away. Let's see, this is about, I guess it's a little more than a foot. This is probably like 14 or maybe 16 inches away from my face. And um, it does a pretty good job, especially if there isn't a giant noise source right next to it. Um, this thing is not expensive at all. And honestly, it's been great for me. This is, um, let me find a link to that. This is the uh, Movo VXR10. And I don't know, it does a good job. It's it's super cheap. The You can definitely go a lot fancier um, for the tables when I do the streams over there, the table that I use has a Samson CO2. It is uh, actually sold as a stereo mic pair. And that one is also great. I like it a lot. That one is an XLR microphone though. So you need to connect it into something before you can, before you can get into your ATEM or camera. So for that one, I use like a zoom L zoom recorder audio interface and that one also works great. I like that one a lot. And I don't know if normally, I, th I, th I, think, I think they do a good job. They don't have to be cranked up too high on the gain for it to work well. Um, but generally the closer the microphone to your mouth, the better. That's always gonna be true, no matter what microphone it is. Oh, this is a good question. How do you maintain some sort of version control for your stream deck configuration? I don't right now at all. I don't, I just configure the buttons and it is, uh, yeah, that's it. I should be better about that. And my ATEM macros are even more of a mess, but frankly, I reconfigure everything in here so much anyway that I don't really think it's that. It's, I, I just don't see a lot of value, I guess, in version controlling it because it's so easy to recreate um, anyway. Would you recommend Stream Deck Mobile for ATEM Mini Pro ISO scripting and macros? Is is Stream Deck Mobile the um, is that the like interface for it that you can load onto a phone? Yeah, okay. So it's just like a phone version of the buttons. Yeah, I think that's great. The the I guess the question with that is, can you route that through Companion? I'm not sure. Um, I haven't seen that working with companions, so I would need to double check that. But if it does, if it, if it can sort of emulate a, a stream deck the same way that a real stream deck can is into the companion software, then yeah, absolutely. Only downside is I guess you lose the physical button, so you can't do things by touch. So like normally I can sort of, without looking, know what button I'm on and press a button without having to make sure I'm poking at just the right spot on, on the smooth phone interface. Is a working 3D printer behind you? Yes, it is. I can show you what it's doing because it's doing the last pieces for this. It is printing my little stands for my converters. So I have, I need a whole bunch of these SDI to, or HDMI to SDI bi-directional converters behind this contraption on my desk to get everything in and out of SDI. And it turns out that when you just pile them together, it's a giant mess. 
So I made a little, I designed this little stand for them. And you can see there's, uh, there's a little angle here because my rack is at an angle. This is tilted. So this is the same angle so that when that sits there, these things are then stacked vertically. And the thing printing right now is the last shelf and then a lid for it. So each of these is a separate piece where they're kind of tight, but each of these is a, there we go, separate little, one of these is all the same, all the same part. Is that going to focus? Come on. I think I locked, locked my focus on that camera. There we go. Uh, so each of these is a piece that I've that I've uh, print, been printing out, and then they stack together. So the next one does not have the little pins, and then the top fits into that. So I'll have five of these in the stack, and you can print more or less of them if you want. So I'll eventually make that file available to download uh, somewhere because um, now that I've got that design done, I think I'm pretty happy with it. I'm gonna probably just tape it to the top of the of the rack stuff back there. Can you tell me please what camera you're using to stream and how you get the quality so high? Also, can you explain what is meant by the upscaling on the A10 Mini? So this is the Lumix G7. It's my favorite streaming camera because it is extremely affordable and also um, pretty high quality, frankly. And uh, let me drop a link to that. So here is the Lumix G7. The kit lens is a 14 to 42 millimeter, which is actually also fine. It, go, it does a pretty good range by itself. Normally I use a 15 millimeter lens. And then actually today, because I was changing things up, this is the 12 to 30, 35, 12 to 35. That's, yeah. So um, I don't think there's a huge difference between all of those lenses for this kind of thing, frankly. So um, any of those are fine. The kit lens is fine. The camera is $500 new and uh, that's one of the reasons that I like it for a streaming camera because I don't mind just leaving it here and this is just, it lives on the desk. A um, couple of weird things about the camera, I guess only one. The, the, the thing that may not, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a good general purpose camera, but it is a good streaming camera if all you need is HDMI out. It does clean HDMI out, obviously. However, it cannot do HDMI out when it's recording to an SD card. So that's the limitation here. And that is fine for my use case because I had never put an SD card in it because I never need to record onto it. I'm just using it to get video into the ATEM. And um, that's, yeah, it's the camera I use here. For my other table, I use my GH5S or hopefully soon the Blackmagic camera, but that is, it ends up looking, you know, almost exactly the same. The advantages to the more expensive Lumix cameras other than the G7, start they don't really do anything for streaming right there they have a lot of way better features for filming and photography and things like that but just as an input video source for this thing this thing does a great job so this is running into the atem and the atem is set to the streaming high quality which is um streaming at about six megabits a second right now and it is um yeah that's that's about it. I guess the other piece here, of course, is the lighting. So for the lighting, there is a large light above me. And you can see the microphone right there, too. So that's the light that is pretty much the only light source in this room right now. Um, so it's shining down at a slight angle. The angle's about like that. So the light's over there, camera's over there. And, and I do have my light for the table um, shining this way, which is sort of doing this little highlight. It's not in the perfect spot, and I would like to also get something more directly overhead. So I'm going to work on the lighting still, but I think I need to actually mount some stuff onto the ceiling or onto this wall up there so I can hide it out of the frame. So strong lighting and uh, a nice DSLR mirrorless camera, and that's, I think, what it takes. All right, let me keep going.
Can the new mini converters allow Blackmagic 4K camera to be controlled by an ATEM mini via two converters with SDI transfers to extend the distance greater than HDMI is reliable? Yes. So that is the advantage to the new converters. The new bi-directional 3G does not work with the old ones, but they put special stuff into these to translate the control signals. And it goes both directions. So if you have an HDMI, if you're using this to get SDI cameras into your ATEM, then your ATEM mini can control the SDI cameras over its HDMI connection. So you would do one HDMI from the output into the ATEM, and then your two SDI runs to the camera, and then it can figure it out. It works the other way as well, where if you want a, um, if you want to use the SDI switcher, like the Television Studio HD, you run your two SDIs into that, and then you run your HDMI in into the Blackmagic Pocket Camera, and uh, that will convert the, the control signals as well. So you can control the HDMI camera from an SDI switcher. Um, theoretically, it should work to go two of them. So two SDIs into the two SDIs here and have HDMIs on both ends. And it should also work. However, I have not actually yet tested that and I kind of now want to try it. Probably not gonna do that right now because my camera is not readily accessible, but I do have the camera, the Blackmagic camera. I do have the A10 mini. So, and I do have plenty of SDI cables now. That would be a good thing to test. Um, it should work though, in theory. So I will, I will report back on that. Have you had any more experience with the Hollyland Lark 150? They look really good. I'd be interested in seeing what range they have. I have, I have actually been using them in a bunch of streams. So I've been using them when I'm doing the streams over at the table so that I can walk around. Uh, I think that was one I used during the whole build with me where I built this desk and uh, it's been great. I haven't had a lot of chance to test the range of them because I mostly exist inside this small rectangle these days. And I haven't had a lot of options to, um, I haven't had a lot of chances to, to actually use them for long range tests, but yeah, they've been, they've been pretty great. How are you monitoring Raspberry Pis in the studio? So right now I, I actually haven't had a monitor plugged into my Raspberry Pi in ever in the studio. So the, I have one Raspberry Pi in here that I use for the uh, running companion on the stream deck and it is, I mostly, I set it up once, plug into a monitor, set up the software, put it here, and it's been running ever since. I had, I did a little bit of troubleshooting on it two weeks ago. Maybe it was last week. I took it home and uh, went and plugged into a monitor to try some stuff because I thought it was the Raspberry Pi was dying, but it turns out it was my network switch that was dying, so that was cool. Um, but yeah, I haven't needed to. However, I am planning on putting it back into hooking it back into the system now that I have the ability to swap out my HDMI inputs. So I'm going to plug in its HDMI output into a converter, run it into the matrix, and then I can be like, oh, now I want the Raspberry Pi. I want this to be my Raspberry Pi monitor. So let's go ahead and flip that. Or I can use one of these little ones for the Raspberry Pi monitor instead. And that's how I'm planning on uh, using it for things other than just companions. So I'll be able to play videos out on stuff like uh, using using software and things like that, or using it as a streaming bridge clone. The the main way that I need to access it if I'm trying to debug things is over SSH. So I just connect with my computer over SSH into that device, and then I can restart services or run commands or install software. While doing live events, sometimes we need to play videos from a computer. What's the easiest way to play the video by single click button and then get back to live video once the video ends? Ooh, that's, that's a tricky one for uh, timing. The, I don't know if there's any, someone must have done this. There, if there was a video software, play, playback software that supported the ATEM control protocol, then it could send the ATEM a command to switch back. Um, Otherwise, otherwise playing from a computer. Yeah, I'm not sure. 
I've done this with the Hyperdeck where I've made a macro that loads in a clip, hits go, and then has a delay the same length as the video, which will then switch to the camera back after the video plays. But that's not obviously from a computer. If anybody knows of software that can do that, uh, where the software playback software supports the ATEM control software or protocol so that the when the video ends on the computer, it would send the camera switch command to the ATEM. Let me know. How long does the printing take? Oh yeah, a long time. So this piece, it's tight fit. This piece, about an hour. And I had four of these going overnight last night where I was just, I just let them run and I went home and they worked. It didn't fall apart, luckily. So each of these is about an hour. The top part's gonna be about a half hour. So no, actually longer than that. Um, wait, no, two hours. Each of these is two hours, right? Cause the whole stream ran for eight hours or the print ran for eight hours yesterday. And so I did a couple of like test prints to make sure that these little pegs could fit into the little hole. And I got it wrong the first time it was way too tight. So I shrunk those. And then I wanted the, I wanted this to be able to slide in, but then not be able to just slide out. So if you can see it kind of falls into place and then it doesn't slide but there's still enough room up there. So it took a, a, an extra try to get that to work right with enough of a, a little lip there to not fall out. So now it like won't fall out. So a couple of test, test runs and for the test runs, I try to print just the small piece so that it doesn't take two hours and I waste a whole chunk of plastic. Um, so like for testing the little lips, I can do just printing a small surface and seeing how the tolerances work. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, it's fun. I'm just getting the hang of it. I've never done 3D printing before, much less 3D modeling. So it's been fun to learn that stuff. Talk a little about how you set up your YouTube schedule announcement to support streaming start at a specific time. Yeah. Okay. So the way that I, there's basically two pieces to it. I go into YouTube studio and I create a scheduled stream. So that is, that is, let me see if I can, I think I can just show you in this. I don't see why not. So if I show you, let me show you my computer screen. If I go here, schedule stream, I can reuse a previous stream or create a new one, give it a title, schedule it for a date. This doesn't really do anything like scheduling it here doesn't actually do much. So all that does is tells YouTube when you think you are going to uh, start the stream. So once you do that, let's see, test, let me make that not public. Otherwise people will get a notification. And oh yeah, I made a stream for my printer so I could watch it last night. Uh, okay, so there is the stream. And uh, thankfully, the stream keys are all start out. Uh, thanks, YouTube. And the thing to look for here is this auto start. Now, I usually have this set to off. And the reason I set it to off is because I don't want the stream. I want to make sure that I control when it goes live. So the auto start will uh, when it went off, basically it means that you can start feeding video to that stream key on YouTube and YouTube just says, cool, the connection's good. And then you have to actually press the go live button here. So that's how I like to do it so that it is easier for me to control when it actually starts. And then the, um, so that's all set up in YouTube. There's a scheduled start date, which all it does is it just like shows up in YouTube when you visit the video, it says, says like, we'll be live at 10 AM or whatever. And it localizes it. That doesn't actually do anything automatic. There's no automation there. So then when you're ready, you go in back into that video, start streaming to that stream key. And then when you're ready, you press go live. So I press go live a few minutes before the scheduled time. YouTube doesn't care. Just the scheduled time doesn't really do anything again. So you press go live. It is live. 
YouTube starts sending out the announcements or whatever, the not notifications to random people, as far as I can tell. And then you're live. So then I have my little countdown playing and the countdown will, um, I've, I've timed it so that the video loop that's playing, the countdown will end at the start time at 10 o'clock. And that's just because I press the play button on the countdown at the right time to make that work. So, okay. So that's that. And then separately from that, there's the email notifications that I set up. So if you go to, um, Aaron P Aaron PK TV, and if you go scroll down, you'll see next live stream, recent videos. And at the bottom, there's a newsletter subscription where you can subscribe to notifications by via email. And that is a totally separate thing that I've set up where it's basically some custom code that I wrote where I am pulling my YouTube feed, looking at the API to, to grab all the upcoming videos. And that is then based on the scheduled start time of the video. So when my script notices a live stream is scheduled for a certain time, it will then 30 minutes ahead of time, send out the email. And that is, uh, that's again, totally separately from like anything to do with whether or not I've actually started the video. So this could fail if, for example, I schedule a stream and then don't show up, like the email still goes out and it doesn't know whether or not I'm actually live. So the email is based on the scheduled start time. So I have to make sure I set the scheduled start time and then stick to it. And otherwise it will just sort of not match up. But so far, so good. It's been working pretty well. Hopefully that helps. Uh, okay, cool. Oh, I got, I got scrolled way back through the chat. Oh, thanks YouTube Dave for the super chat. What's, uh oh, something changed. I can't click it. Sorry. I have to fix my plugin now. The, the, this is what happens when I run a, a hacky version of live chat overlays is if YouTube changes the HTML on the page, my plugin fails. So. Thanks, uh, YouTube Dave, for the super chat. Also, why didn't my light change? That's interesting. I wonder if YouTube changed stuff that broke if this then that also. Okay, let me scroll back to questions. Pretty nice idea to stack the converters. Think, thanks, yeah. Um, that was actually inspired, the stacking with these little shelves was inspired by Raspberry Pi stacks I've seen. So I was going for a stacking design that was like sort of all one piece. And then I realized that was just not practical to print. So I looked at the uh, Raspberry Pi. I started looking for Raspberry Pi racks and I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You just stack them. Oh, this super chat worked. Thanks, Chuck. I appreciate it. Oh, interesting. This looks different than, than YouTube Dave's. So. Uh, Dave, what did you do differently? Look at this. If you look in the chat, here is the super chat and it says, oh, there's a comment. That's what it is. Chuck had text there and Dave didn't. So I can't click it. Well, thanks. Thanks for testing it. All right. Let's again, if you do have a question for me, make sure you mention my name. Otherwise it's going to scroll. I'm going to scroll by without noticing it. When you're on location, do you recommend a separate router with 4G, 5G where the ATEM is connected or connect it to the MacBook via USB LAN and mobile Wi-Fi? So I, the, the ATEM mini would, did, would, did not exist when I was doing things on set before everything shut down in March which is now coming up on a year, which is really sad. Um, uh, but, oh, thanks for the super chat. Droopy dog. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, okay. So this is, yeah. So the ATEM mini didn't exist. And that means that the only option I had for controlling the ATEM was over the network. And my preferred way to do that 
over the network is by building my own network in my little desk. So for the the video I did where I had everything everything on the bike that was um, built into a for you case and in that case was a a router and a switch so i can wire everything into it and for the a10 mini i think i would still do the same thing i don't think i would want to also have to plug in my usb into my laptop i think i would rather just have everything be on the network so what that means is basically the the kit that i build for going somewhere is a self-contained network even if there's no internet connection. So that will function whether or not there is an internet connection to that whole kit. So I have my own router. It has its own DHCP server in it. It's issuing IP addresses for everything on the network where I can then control all the IP addresses and know where to find everything on the network. And then when I need to stream from that, I will give that router an internet connection. And then that can be done a few different ways. And that can be done by tethering a device to my phone, either Wi-Fi or USB. It could be done by plugging in Ethernet to the venue's internet. Um, it could be putting a SIM card into the mobile router. So there's a bunch of options for that, but how that gets internet is a separate problem from how you talk to the stuff in the box. So that's the way I like to deal with it, is, is treating those as separate problems and having it so that I'm not reliant on that device having internet to control all of the things in that on the desk. Look at Casper CG for Windows Play video on Companion Stream Deck. Ah, cool. Okay, that's a good idea. That is, if it can integrate with, integrate with Companion, then you can send the ATEM a command to switch the camera back after the video is done. Hit that like button, my chat friends. Yes, hit that like button. I see a lot of people in here and uh, only 33 likes on this video. I gotta get my like animation back so I can make the likes rain. All right. Ooh, here's a good question. Is there any solution for double Wi-Fi? If one Wi-Fi is down, two Wi-Fi kicks in. Sort of, so this is called network bonding and it gets expensive very quickly. So there is a way to do it with uh, a Raspberry Pi, but then you're dealing with a lot of networking knowledge to make that work, and it is possible. Um, the other way to do it is you can get dedicated network bonding routers where you can give them multiple SIM cards to, to connect multiple uh, LTE connections or Wi-Fi, so things like that. Um, the there's also some VPN solutions that can do it. I am going to try to actually evaluate one of those and test it out. So yeah, lots of options for that, but it, it does add up. I will, I will uh, give you fair warning. Thank you, Chris, for the super chat. Q and A sessions are much appreciated. I, I appreciate your super chat. Thanks a lot. Yes, Peplink is one of those, but expensive. Okay, scrolling back up. I have recently bought an ATEM Mini Pro ISO and I'm either not using it right. I have a Sony A7 III and Canon 70D. What is, oh, there's the rest of the question. Is there a way to adjust the input feed on the ATEM to adjust the zoom centering of the picture like you can do in OBS or Wirecast? Kind of. So not it's not the same as OBS or Wirecast, there is one thing you can do, and I think I can actually show it to you on this. So let me switch to my computer and, oh, now I'm gonna be in here for a while. No, I need to use the upstream key. Okay, so you don't get to see me, but I'm going to try to illustrate this with my, with my picture, with the computer, otherwise you won't be able to see what I'm doing. So this is why I usually have two ATEMs set up so I can experiment with one and show it to you. Uh, but that's not how this is wired up today. So what you need to do is 
there's no way to like take a regular input and then just make it bigger. You, but you can use the upstream key to do that. So this is set up to, let's see, this is set up to put my face in the corner and oh, now it's at some weird rectangle. So there's the mask, but what you can do is you can actually, yeah, we'll just, we'll just try this. So if I put this back to the center, so zero X zero Y. Now look, I'm like small. If I make myself, excuse me, full size. Now it's like, there's, it's like the key is not being used. So, but if I go back here and I type like 1.5, now I'm big and I can shrink back down. Right? So you can actually use the upstream keyer to like crop and then you can offset as well by, uh, by doing this position position X, position Y. So you can see I'm, I can move myself up and down with the Y and uh, zoom in. I can even then crop the sides if I wanted to. So you can kind of use it for that. I will say it's not really like, it's not really meant for that, uh, but it does work. It is, however, not the same at all as doing it in OBS or Wirecast. Oh, wait, there was a follow up question to that. Can you assign that to the original camera buttons? No, the buttons on the ATEM itself are not assignable at all. I, this is something I've been asking for forever to be able to just use them as macro buttons. Uh, but no, those are not assignable. The only options you get are the behavior of how, whether the key stays on when you press the camera button. And that's something you can set up in the ATEM setup app. All right, let me go back up. Where was that question? What kind of equipment do you, would you use to do 4G streaming with multiple SIM cards? There are dedicated routers that take multiple SIM cards and can either do a joint bonded connection or failover. Uh, they're very, very expensive. And I, for what I'm doing, it's not really worth it because I don't, I would rather, I don't, I don't do a lot of, um, gigs that are, that require a wireless connection, like out in a field or something. And I would much rather have a wired connection to do the streaming from, like if I'm going to be at a, at a conference venue, I'm going to make them give me an ethernet line to plug into my router because it's going to be more reliable always than 4G streaming. And that way it's their fault if the internet, internet goes down and not mine. So I don't. But yeah, if you do have to do 4G streaming, then you're going to have to spend a lot of money to get that redundancy if you don't want to rely on just one SIM card. YouTube Dave had, had an emoji also. Oh, that's interesting. He did. It was on set. Interesting. Okay, so it's a new chat message type that I need to deal with in the plugin. That's what it is. Chuck used Super Chat. I use Super Sticker. That explains it. So the Super Sticker is the one that is not being handled right in the plugin. Cool. Uh, well, in that case, I need to like grab this so that I can I can test it later because otherwise the uh, otherwise the I'm gonna have to like spend money to, to grab that. So this is some, some behind the scenes, uh, how this works. I've just gone up and grabbed the source for, where did it go? Grab the source for the sticker. Uh oh, it's gone. There it is. And I'm going to grab this and just copy it into a text file because then I can, uh, debug that later without having to send myself a super sticker to see that markup later. <laughs> okay. Is it right that the ATEM does not save screenshots after reboot? It does now. Well, okay, no. The ATEM Mini, the original one, does not. That one doesn't have memory in it to be able to do that. The Pro and the ISO do. However, I think you still have to um, click the Save Startup State button. 
So nothing really saves automatically, but if you go up into the software control, you can do save startup state, and that will then save the current state of, of the ATEM, including all of the stuff in the media pool. So that is a recent update to make sure you updated the latest firmware, but it then will save the files in the, uh, in the ATEM itself but you do have to press that save startup state. Rick asks non live stream question. Did you do anything to the new desk following the desk build live stream? Um, the desk itself? No, the desk itself is untouched. Mm -hmm. I did put the, I did put the, um, this in the right spot. Oh, come on camera. What's, what's going on with you today? Focus. What are you focusing on? Uh, so yeah, I put this in the right spot. I got the monitors mounted. I kind of did some readjusting and uh, got all this wired up so that you can see you can see my my ATEM is wired into the little patch panel. Got an Ethernet connection, and uh, that's basically all I've done since the the stream. So it is working pretty well now, other than the fact that it is extremely loud. But that'll change tomorrow when I get that part in. I guess, I guess not tomorrow because. It's going to arrive in tomorrow's mail, so it'll be Tuesday. Is there, I wish there was a way to use Zoom like Teams meeting with Teams I can use NDI and separate the callers as individual sources. Yeah, I don't think I've seen anything that can you, where you can do that in Zoom yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the works just because everybody wants to do it. And you can at least use, if you set Zoom into uh, dual monitor mode, then you do get a dedicated window for the active speaker. And that way you can at least full screen that into an ATEM and switch to that. And then you, you uh, don't get all the like controls and, and other stuff. So that's a nicer option for at least the active speaker. But I don't think, I guess you could pin, you could then switch cam, um, you could switch to pinned video from speakers and pin certain people over there, but it's not, you're not gonna get every caller as a separate source into your ATEM. All right. I bought an ATEM Mini Pro. And I don't have sound input via mic and HDMI. My levels are zero, and I'm watching direct in HDMI output. Is it software or hardware problem? Well, I would check your configuration first. So, if you go into the audio tab, make sure that your uh, make sure that your Sources are on here. Make sure the volume is set to everything's at zero. And I would check that first just to make sure this is right. And you should, like, for example, when this is down, um, you won't see any levels, even though there is audio coming in on that channel right now. But if I move this up, now you can see the, um, oh, wait, why is, oh, the, that was from a camera that just died. Um, Hang on, I need to switch my, I need to switch my ATEM4 back to the HyperDeck. Okay, so now it's the HyperDeck, and you can see the this is the music from the countdown timer. So when this is down to zero, you won't see any levels. So double check all this first, just to make sure that it's not something silly that's wrong. And um, if if you're really not getting any audio after that, then that might be a hardware problem. Thanks for the super chat, John. I appreciate it. And Arizona Goldens, thanks for answering. Can you show how to assign that upstream macro when you click on the camera input? Is it better to have a live stream rig first? ATEM. So the there is no way to assign that stream upstream that uh, that macro with any buttons on the ATEM. I wish that, I really wish there was, but you can use a separate control device to trigger macros. So for me, I use the Stream Deck. That's my camera battery just died, so can't show it to you anymore. But that's the little uh, Stream Deck little fifteen button um, device. You can use the little um, 
boxes I've been building with the M5 stick devices, which is a little hardware device that um, that can that can run a macro. Basically, there's like a ton of options. You can use a phone and buttons on the phone even. So there's a ton of options for controlling the ATEM. And the the trick is that when you when you want to break something up like that, make it a macro. That way you can get any of those devices to just run a macro. And then anything you can do with a macro, you can then trigger from any button. It just, it's just that you can't use the actual buttons on the ATEM. And this is why I want to be able to reassign those to macros, because then I could just have the ATEM Mini with all of its buttons would be a fantastic control surface by itself. But there are lots of good uh, control surfaces, control devices as well anyway. And thank you for the super chat. And thank you, Tom, for the super chat as well. I really appreciate it. All right. Ooh, scrolling back through the chat. We are almost at the top of the hour, too. Here we go. I ran some tests that compare the USB output of the ATEM Mini and the HDMI output in OBS via a deck link card. It seems the HDMI is so much better in terms of quality. Do you confirm? I've definitely seen there's some color issues with the USB output. The um, color range is different, and it ends up looking like the blacks get darker and the whites get brighter. And I'm hoping they end up fixing that in the future because that is definitely uh, strange. Other than that, I don't really see much of a difference. Technically, the HDMI is a lot better quality because it's not compressed, whereas the USB output is JPEG compressed. But the difference there, you're going to have a hard time n noticing that for any practical... That makes some funny sounds. You're going to have a hard time noticing that for any sort of practical uh, things, really. The Normally, the quality issues that you're getting over USB are because of what you're feeding it into, which is going to be video conferencing software. And then you're at the mercy of whatever they're doing to the signal, which is going to be serious compression. So that's normally the, the differences. But yeah, technically, the, the um, USB output is more, is more compressed and does have that weird color range issue. Check out David Joshua for channel. He's doing cool stuff with this ATEM controlling VLC for video playback and ATEM control. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah, that sounds great. I will take a look at that. VLC is, if you can use VLC in conjunction with all that, that would be great. Have you looked at Speedify for network bonding? That's the one that I'm going to try out. Yep. It does look pretty easy. I'm hoping that works well. Okay, scroll. Here we go. Oh, this is a good question. Is there any way I can have two different pictures and pictures on the A10 Mini? No. No. There's only one. So the picture in picture uses the upstream keyer. That's where you get the um, ability to scale one of the inputs. And that is the only thing that can actually scale inputs. The downstream key can overlay stuff. So th this chat is using the downstream key. And it's the background of the chat is black. So like if I show you my computer screen, you can see that the, uh, well, now they're overlaid on top of each other, but the background of this, of this chat is black, and that means that the downstream key can take that out, but I can't scale that. And the upstream key is the only one that can scale it, and there's only one upstream key in it. So you can't do two pictures and pictures. You can chain another A10 Mini behind it to do picture and picture in both, combine it together, that does work. But if you want more than that, you're gonna have to spend a lot more money on the much more expensive switchers. All right, we're about at the top of the hour, so I'm going to see if there's any last questions I can get to here. Well, the ATEM Mini Pro ISO record ISOs if the feed is from a wireless source, or it must be an HDMI connection for ISO recording. Also, what about SDI? So the ATEM Mini only has four HDMI inputs. So that's the only video that can get sent into it in the first place. And whatever is on those HDMI inputs will be recorded. So if you have a wireless source, 
like a Hollyland transmitter, the receiver is an HDMI device. So like this wireless camera that just battery died, the receiver is a Hollyland HDMI receiver plugged into the A10 mini. So yes, it's wireless, but also uh, the A10 mini doesn't really know about that. It just sees an HDMI source. And the same is true with SDI because you have to convert SDI to HDMI for the ATEM to use it. And at that point, it's, a, it's on the HDMI input of the ATEM mini, and then it will be recorded. Okay, last. I think it says only uploaded pictures, not screenshots. By screenshots, do you mean grab still? Because it, should, it shouldn't care where those came from. When you use grab still, it uploads it into the media pool. And then after that, if you click save startup state, it should save it. Pretty sure. Uh, you have a super cool stand for the A10 Mini Pro. Can you please show that? And if possible, share a link to buy. I sure can. I'm, I thought that was in the description, but it might not be. If you look for... Oh, I can also tell you how to find these links. In the future. So if you go to aaronpk.tv slash products, um, search my affiliate links. So if you go to this link, you can type in a 10 mini stand and then you will find a link to anything that matches a 10 mini stand, which here's the link. And you can actually buy this now. So this is the, um, it's it's a 3D printed part, but DBE store is actually selling them. So you can go ahead and grab your own now. Okay. And I think, oh, thanks, John. Appreciate it. Thanks for the super chat. Okay, I think with that, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but I'll be back next week for another round of this. And feel free to join me tomorrow for uh, Build With Me. Tomorrow I'm doing tomorrow I'm doing a stream where... What's the one tomorrow? Tomorrow I'm doing... Trying out the mirror cast adapters. So I've got a whole pile of these little mirror casts, which are like Chromecast clones. So I'm going to try a bunch of those out, see if they support, see if they don't do HTCP, see if I can use them directly with the ATEM for chat, see how those work. Um, that'll be fun. That's going to be a lot of just watching me unplug things and plug them back in. Um, but hey, we'll, we'll hang out and have a good time. And then on Tuesday, the 5th, I'm going to be testing out a bunch of capture cards. So for that one, I'm going to try to run my test video uh, stress test clip into all the, the capture cards. And then we can actually look at seeing how well they deal with complicated graphics, full color ranges, pixel pixelization, and see how they handle all those different artifacts. So that should be a fun one as well, or possibly very tedious. I will try and take notes on all of these and um, do at least a write-up. I don't know if I'm going to do another video besides the live stream about the results, but at the very least, I'll be able to set up, uh, do a write-up of the results afterwards. So thank you, Nathan. Thanks for the super chat. And thank you all. Thumbs up this video. And with that, I will see you all next week.